Hello and welcome to episode 29 of Question and Answer. I am your host, Panyol Basa, and I am sitting in my front yard in the soupy humidity of a South Carolina summer. Just uh, to have good scenes, good scenery, including the fish pond that has loaches in it. But uh, I can do a separate video about loaches some other time, I suppose. So I suppose I should just uh, get to the question answering part, which is, after all, the most important part of these videos. And uh, we don't have like a really ungodly amount of questions here, which is good, I suppose, because we should avoid excessive ungodliness in our lives. So the first question is from Carl N. And Carl N. says, is the becoming that is talked about in the second noble truth the same as the becoming bhava link of dependent origination how exactly would you define becoming i've heard a monk define it as quote the taking on of an identity based on a particular desire in a world of experience unquote thoughts question mark well that's a good question i think that is a good philosophical question about uh, what exactly does bhava mean and usually it is rendered into English as becoming, becoming, um, which isn't very explanatory. Um, and I don't have the exact formula of the Four Noble Truths here, but if my memory serves me correctly, um, the bhava or becoming is referring to, in, in the Second Noble Truth, like craving and attachment that result in bhava, or are conducive to bhava, which would be, in that case, something like uh, continued existence in samsara. And that's generally what bhava means, at least superficially. It means continued existence in samsara. But when you get to dependent origination, uh, paticca samupada, things get more complicated because paticca samupada is um, on the one hand, it's considered to be central to Buddhist philosophy. Like there are suttas, at least one, where the Buddha says, you know, if you if you see, you know, if you see Paticca Samuppada, you see just Dharma. Dharma is Paticca Samuppada. Um, you know, if you if you understand that, you understand Buddhism essentially. Um, and also, on there's a legend that the Buddha considered. Paditya Samuppada to be so subtle, so difficult to understand that he almost just didn't teach Buddhism at all. He almost became like a hermit Buddha, a, a Pacheka Buddha, and um, just was just going to keep his mouth shut because he figured nobody would understand dependent core rising or dependent origination or conditioned genesis, or there's a whole bunch of different names for it, which indicates that it's not really all that well understood by the translators into English, and it really wasn't all that well understood um, by ancient monks and medieval commentators. So the Buddha came pretty close to being entirely right on, on his guess that nobody would understand it. Um, in Buddhism, it crystallized fairly early into uh, the 12 Nidana theory, which is 12 links, which is explaining, you know, this causes that, that causes that, that causes that, which explains what causes reincarnation essentially. So it starts with ignorance, usually, not always. There are some versions where it, it starts with something else like Papancha Sankha, but we don't need to get into that. Um, so Bhava in independent co-origination, co um, it comes in between Upadana and Jati. So Upadana usually is translated as clinging, and Jati is translated as birth. So that's Jati is uncontroversial. So the way I would interpret upadana is literally it means uptaking. And so it, I would consider that to mean uptake because you have craving, you have uptake. You know, you just accumulate in your life. And because of that, this uptake, you've got bhava. And bhava, I interpret it to mean the just the momentum of existence it's like it's essentially karma and the ancient monks 
agreed that bhava in dependent origination does mean essentially karma. It's the karma in this life that results to taking on the next birth. That's why bhava leads to jati or birth. So um, becoming, quote unquote, results in birth, which according to the orthodox Theravadan explanation means that your karma in this life results in taking a next life, you know, rebirth, reincarnation. So, um, but I interpret karma also to just mean like the momentum of your, of your mind. It's the momentum of mind, psychic momentum. And uh, so that results in further existence, regardless of whether it's, um, you know, another hour or an another life. So I think, uh, surprisingly, I answered that one fairly quickly. Let's see, I'll, I'll go over the question again just to make sure. Is the becoming that is talked about in the Second Noble Truth the same as the becoming link of dependent origination? It can be. Um, if, you, if you talk to some Abhidhamma scholar, they might quibble and say that there are subtle differences or some such, but it could be interpreted the same. It just, in, in the sense of just further existence in samsara, or the force of further existence, the force of existence. You know, just the momentum of your volitional acts of your of your personality for lack of a better word uh so yeah i guess i answered that one so i'll just move on to the next question and which is from trumpasatva and trumpasatva says does Buddhism ever explain how animals with little or no mental faculties, such as fish or worms, create kama? Humans can generate bad kama and be reborn as such animals, but those animals do not have the capacity to generate the mental states to leave such existences. It doesn't seem to make any sense that it is a one-to-one -one rebirth into a lower or higher life form. A human and fish may both be animals, but a fish Fish's mind or body can't possibly carry on the kama created by a higher form of intelligent life, or even that of a deva or a sura. Dependent origination doesn't seem to answer how such a jump between realms is made. Just sort of arbitrary ideas are found in the Jataka tales. Yeah, I've thought about this a lot. And uh, um, maybe I shouldn't mention this, but I will anyway. That My father... Um, he was a hypnotist and he trained spirit mediums. I guess they're called channelers or downloaders or something now. But this was like back in the 60s and 70s. And um, a woman in a trance started uh, channeling uh, a dead Vietnamese Buddhist monk named Tay Sing, who taught some Buddhism to my father. Apparently he was also my father's guardian spirit or just a, a spirit a disembodied spirit who took a, a great interest in my father's life and uh he just got indignant that the dead vietnamese monk channeled through the uh the housewife in a trance um he was just indignant at the very idea that a human could be reborn as a dog um yeah and i i have thought about that i mean it's like a human is very complex and then being reborn as a worm or like a, an earwig or something, it doesn't make much sense. It would be, I mean, it, it is possible. I mean, theoretically, just for example, there is a, a heaven realm called the realm of the perceptionless Brahmas in Buddhist cosmology, where the beings there are just completely unconscious. They're like statues, they don't move. So it could be something like that, where it's like your karma just goes dormant there's just this little spark of awareness still going. Um, so, yeah, I, I think just according to the theory, just assuming for the sake of argument that the theory is valid, that a human being could be reborn as a bug or a worm or something. Um, yeah, I mean, it would just mean that, I mean, almost all of your karma would just become like... Uh, underlying tendencies, anusia, just, it would just kind of go dormant for lack of any opportunity to arise. Um, but a worm being reborn as a human, I mean, unless it was just one of those cases of most of the karma was dormant. I mean, it was just a, some being that through some weird 
you know, some weird fluke, you know, you have some higher being that through some weird, bizarre fluke, you know, they die in a coma or something. They're just in a semi-conscious state, very low level of consciousness when they die that could move to the next life, which might be an animalistic one or something. And then uh, finally they snap out of it or something. Um, but as a general rule, in, in just in general, I'm, I'm skeptical of the, the whole idea of like humans being reborn as worms and vice versa. Um, there are stories of lower animals that uh, had, you know, had a lot of merit. You know, like there's the famous Jataka story of the fish king in the, the Buddha as in previous existence was king of the fishes in this pond. And the pond was drying up in a drought. And so this fish king um, made some uh, assertion of truth. And I don't remember what the assertion of truth was, but it's by the by this truth, you know, may it rain. And then there was this rainstorm. And so he, the fish king saved his school of fish, um, you know, through his, he had essentially human intelligence. And if you read the Jataka stories, you know, all these animals had human intelligence and could talk and so forth. And uh, there is a story of the frog who went to heaven. Um, what is it? Manduka. Is that how you say frog in Pali? The Manduka Deva. Um, where the Buddha was giving a, a, a talk. And there were a lot of people gathered around. And there was a frog sitting there. And the frog was just... It, it was, he didn't understand what the Buddha was saying. But it was just like the, the calmness and serenity... And just the, the melodious tones of the Buddha's voice caused the frog to feel like uplifted in this primitive little way. You know, it, it was feeling this little froggy exaltation or something. And then I think it was a shepherd who had a, a stick was, I mean, not on purpose, just purely accidentally just moved his stick and crushed the frog right when the frog was just listening intently to the sound of the Buddha's voice. And that was enough merit that the frog wound up in heaven um as a deva uh but i mean these are just stories so i didn't need to get back to this question from trumpasattva let see does buddhism ever explain how animals with little or no mental faculties create karma well they would create just very crude you know little 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 karma because they got such a small consciousness you know they've got such a small mind that only they can only make small karma um so yeah, they create karma and it's just more like ignorance and, and craving and fear. Um, with regard to like a, an insect, I'm skeptical that they even really have perceptions, really. I mean, they might have some kind of feeling like Vedana, but uh, whether they actually form a, any kind of very simple little concept about it, you know, sanya, perception, I'm very skeptical even of that. Uh, but I'll, let's, get, let's continue with this question here. Humans can generate bad karma and be reborn as such animals. Yeah, maybe. But those animals do not have the capacity to generate the mental state to leave such existences. But like I say, I mean, if they were a human in the life before they were the bug, you know, they got they did something really bad, got reborn as a bug. You know, they died, you know, just completely zonked out on, on heroin or something so that they had almost no mental states going when they died. Um, because it really, I think... And well, then they could go back to being human again because they have all this latent karma. So that's a possibility. And according to Buddhist philosophy, I mean, we've been all up and down the scale, you know, forever and ever, you know, just from the beginningless beginning of samsara. It's just been, you know, we've been up in heaven. We've been down in hell. We've been animals, ghosts, you know, monsters, whatever. So, yeah, there could be just a lot of latent karma lurking around, even in bugs, some of them anyway. But... I mean, I am skeptical of that. I've I've come across some heretical theories that um, actually do kind of make more sense to me. Like I read this really weird book called Seth Speaks, where um, this channeler Jane Roberts is supposedly channeling this multi-dimensional being called Seth, and Seth was saying that. Um, Sometimes accidentally, but if you're more advanced, it can be deliberate. You can just deliberately split off some of your own karma to create a new smaller being, you know, like a dog or something. So that's a possibility. Um, but let's get back to the question. I'm, 
I'm, I'm digressing from this question. It doesn't seem to make any sense. There's a one-to-one -one rebirth into a lower or higher life form. A human and fish may be both be animals, but a fish's mind or body can't possibly carry on the karma created by a higher form of intelligent life or even that of a deva or a sura. Dependent origination doesn't seem to answer how such a jump between realms is made. Just sort of an arbitrary ideas are found in the Jataka tales. Yeah, so I guess, I mean, staying within the realm of, of orthodoxy, I would say, you know, it would sort of be like getting a bad rebirth as a bug might be like um, getting a good rebirth as a perceptionless Brahma. It's just that there's, there isn't much mentality going on, which would just mean that most of the karma is just dormant. It's like anusia or underlying tendencies that never have an opportunity to arise, partly because you just don't have a brain to even like conceptualize or form the volition or whatever. So, I mean, and because all beings have just been up and down the scale, according again, according to Orthodox Theravada Buddhism, then uh, pretty much every bug out there would have this baggage of having been a, a god, you know, a zillion gajillion world systems previously or some such. So, yeah, that would be how I would answer it uh, with regard to Orthodox Buddhism. And, I mean, if you deviate from Orthodox Buddhism, then it's all bets are off, you know, it's like no rules. Um, but, yeah, I have been fairly skeptical of the very idea that a human being could be reborn as a worm, except for in very, very rare uh, circumstances. It, you know, there could be something like that going on. Um, yeah, if a worm was reborn as a human without the, the baggage of, you know, an infinitude of past lives, then uh, ah, a very loud car is going on, going behind me. Um, I mean, it would just be like a severely brain damaged human being. And I have, I actually met a person like that in Burma who, I mean, he was essentially like a plant. I mean, he was, his eyes were open. He was kind of conscious. But, I mean, he couldn't really feed himself, or he certainly couldn't talk. He, he didn't seem to be aware of my existence. You know, it's just like the eyes are open, but it's just like this blank look, you know. It's just... So, I mean, a worm being born as a human might be something like that. But, um, I think I should just move on to the next question. Also from Trumpasattva. And Trumpasattva... Ah, uh, in Trumpasattva's next question says, will you ever start a live sutta study group on Discord? And yeah, that's really, I should. I mean, not necessarily live sutta study, but just any kind of live, you know, sort of a group discussion. And I mean, possibly there could be sutta study or something going on. But uh, yeah, people have been asking me this for possibly a year now. And it's just, um, I'm just lacking the the uh, the momentum. You know, it's like inertia or something. It's like trying to get, you know, there's people all over the world. And so trying to get like the right day, the right time and everything is, uh, is daunting. But um, it seems like Saturdays would work best. It used to be Sundays, but now I've got a lot going on on Sundays. So, yeah, maybe... Um, God, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm still saying maybe, but uh, I think just uh, even just a live group would be a good start. And really, I mean, you guys should just get on my case. Seriously, you can just come to South Carolina and kick my butt to get me to do this. It might be what it takes. And I, I do apologize. It's, I've been living in kind of strange um, you know, ever since I stopped being a monk, all of a sudden my life is just radically different than it was before with uh, all these new uh, duties and obligations and distractions and so forth. But I do agree, it would be a good idea if we had a live groups on Discord, maybe two or three different times or days just so that people who live in different parts of the world will have you know, people that were, have a certain work schedule, at least they'll be able to fit in one of them or something. So, yeah, I, just keep keep pestering me into, until I do it, and then I'll do it. <sighs> All right, just move on to the next question from Trumpasattva. 
And this one is something I won't be able to answer very well, I'm sorry to say. What are your impressions on the life of Anagarika Dhammapala? I found him to be very inspirational, yet he is rather unknown in the West. Do you think his model of the Anagarika, or the, the just the homeless one, perhaps omitting the money handling, could be a good model, sort of like the Nagakpa tradition in Tibetan Buddhism, sort of monastic, sort of layperson, wanderer, but not wholly bound to the restrictions for full ordination. Yeah, I've, I've read a little bit about Anagarika Dhammapala. He was um, a friend of Colonel Alcott and maybe Madame Blavatsky in Sri Lanka. So Anagarika Dhammapala, he was a, a Sri Lankan person. And uh, it may be that, especially in Sri Lanka, where the, the monkhood is very, it has had a long reputation for being very lax and kind of corrupt. So it may be that he was sort of just taking his own route, or maybe he just had enough integrity to know or to realize that he didn't want to follow all the rules. And so he called himself an Anagarika or homeless one and wore white, he wore like white robes. And uh, he was uh, instrumental in the founding of the Mahabodhi Society. Um, he did have some influence on uh, the theosophists, the early theosophists. I'm not sure if he was um, communicating with like uh, T.W. Rhys Davids, like the, some of the pioneers in the, the Polytech Society. Um, but uh, he, he was instrumental in sort of bringing awareness of Buddhism to Westerners, even though mostly he lived in Sri Lanka and India. But India was a British colony in those days, so there was a lot of English spoken there and quite a few English people there. So, um, do I think his model of the Anagarika, perhaps omitting the money handling, would be a good model? Well, I think money handling might be pretty much unavoidable since even relatively strict monks in the West, um, you know, they're breaking pretty much the same rules as the monks who are just handling money. Just because, I mean, as I've said before, if you tell someone what to do with money, it's the same as you handling it yourself. You're just handling the person who's handling the money and even just consenting to having the money kept on your behalf is is already against the rules. You're breaking the same Nisagiya Pachidya rule. So, I mean, I found as a monk, a relatively strict one, that the only way not to break the money rules is just have absolutely nothing to do with it. Just live in some remote area that's just poverty stricken, you know, in, in Asia. And um, then you can get along without money. But aside from that, especially in the West, it's it's uh, it's very difficult, and I don't know if anyone fully succeeds in uh, following the money rules in the West. Although, I mean, at least they're they're making like a gesture of not handling it, even though they're consenting to somebody else paying the bills for them. Um, you know, at least they're not handling it themselves. So, I mean, they are making an effort. I'm not really trying to diss them because I mean, I was the same way as a monk. Um, I wasn't handling the money, but, um, you know, you, you just pretty much consent to letting somebody else handle it for you. So I kind of digressed on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I've been talking about this sort of thing for a long time because as I just keep saying over and over again, Theravada Buddhism and the rules of monastic discipline for Theravada Buddhist monks and nuns uh, is designed for ancient North Indian culture. So it's like the, the Ganges Valley in the Iron Age, and it just doesn't fit Western society. And you could argue that, well, that's fine because you're supposed to renounce society anyway, but I mean, you're still gonna be living in the, in the country and participating in the society, at least on the edges. And even that is very difficult. So I don't know, I think just wearing the, wearing the robes, you know, wearing white robes instead of brown ones or yellow ones or whatever. Um, yeah, I think even that, I mean, you're still essentially wearing a toga, which is uh, 
probably not the best way of going about it. Like Buddhist monks, they were wearing essentially the same clothes as everyone else in ancient India. They just uh, dyed them because the lay people usually wore white and they'd have it uh, cut into pieces and sewn back together again if it wasn't just rags that were sewn together. So there was there were those differences, but I mean the style of clothing. I mean, pretty much everybody was wearing the the same stuff. So I mean, if you tried to modernize um, Theravada Buddhist renunciation for the West, again, I just I'd probably just go with you know like uh, army surplus or or just gray sweats, something like that. Um, let's see here. Yeah. And again, I mean, like Anagarika Dhammapala, he was uh, uh, an Anagarika, which is kind of acknowledged as, I mean, it's part of the, the Theravada Buddhist system. In Burma, they have uh, Anagarikas that wear white and they, uh, they only keep eight precepts. Um, and usually it's just little kids. Sometimes they're like toddlers and uh, they're the ones that handle the money at strict monasteries. You know, the little kid will just you know, get sent to the store to get something, which is still against the rules. But so, yeah, I was I was one of these Anagarikas as a, a monastery attendant before I was ordained as a monk. I wore like a white sarong and, and like a white sweater. So I wasn't wearing a toga anyway. And uh, I was handling the money and driving the monks and, and helping to serve them food and so forth. So, I mean, that would be one way of fitting it in without deviating from established tradition but having like entire monasteries composed of these anagarikas or um just an entire community of them that would be interesting i've never heard of that before so yeah i mean it would be something to look into just uh study up what you know the duties of an anagarika are and uh, it would be already established within Theravada. It's been around for probably centuries. Um, otherwise, I mean, you'd just be like breaking new ground and starting your own system of Navakavada or whatever you want to call it with, you know, quasi semi monks in, in gray sweats or, or whatever, you know, army fatigues maybe, although that might be a little too violent for, uh, the people who are definitely into nonviolence and compassion and you know everyone has to feel good and so forth but i mean it would sort of rouse some or sort of the dharma warrior mentality which might be a good thing but i do think it would be important to have the blessing of the ordained theravada buddhist sangha that they would have to be involved in order in order for these people to be calling themselves theravada buddhists um, it would be good, at least, to have the approval of a Theravada Buddhist Sangha. And so they wouldn't be calling themselves ordained monks because they wouldn't be. And they shouldn't be because they wouldn't be following, you know, all these rules that were designed for ancient India. Some, some of the rules they'd follow, you know, no lying, no drinking alcohol, that sort of thing. But... Uh, probably not all of the rules and some of the rules wouldn't even be necessary anymore like why you wouldn't even need a rule um you know forbidding the use of uh, an alms bowl made of a human skull for example so let's see uh, with regard to my impressions on the life of anagarika dhammapala as i said i i really don't know that much about him i've read a little bit about him like you know his his influence on early buddhism and the early theosophists and that sort of thing so he was much more of a big deal a hundred years ago than he is now. But uh, yeah, it is it is something to look into. And uh, I don't think the white robes, I mean, if you're going to deviate from strict monastic discipline, you might as well just bag the togas because really they stick out like a sore thumb. I mean, if you want the mystique, you know, you want to look mysterious and, uh, you know, exotic, maybe wise, you can do that. But um I don't think it's really necessary and that's not the way it originally was. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from the Arya Suwasti project. And this is kind of a, a naughty question, I think. So, but uh, what the hell people are allowed to ask what they want to ask here. So the Arya Suwasti project says there is an abundance of documentation from a certain, here, I got to put my, put my glass down. 
from a certain religious group that they have designs to take over Earth in its entirety. This small ethno group is hell bent on doing so and has been wreaking havoc, especially among the European and Western nations for hundreds of years. There is no debate on the goals and aims as you can hear it for yourself. They have been known to be behind many Marxist, communist, satanic, LGBT movements and my belief they are behind the subversive movement called Christianity. For years, for years in desire to destroy the West, which they term Amalek. My question is, as Buddhists, how should we handle such knowledge? There has to be some remedy when someone is trying to literally kill you and your people off the face of the earth. Everywhere they appear, misery follows. I'm not overstating this. They purposely create friction wherever they are. Talking is only getting us so far. How do we extricate ourselves from such an evil bunch of usurpers that wish nothing but ill will on the entire earth? Is this our karma? What did the Buddha say about handling enemies? Much respect, warm regards, sadhu. So he doesn't mention who he's talking about. And uh, my only conclusion here is that he is insinuating that it's the Jains, or maybe the Amish. But um, let's see here. My belief they are behind the subversive movement called Christianity. Yeah, well, let's see. My question is, as Buddhists, how should we handle such knowledge? Well, I mean, from the Buddhist point of view, I mean, it's just the nature of samsara that it's always going to be messed up. You know, that's why we're here is because we're messed up. And uh, our karma is kind of messed up. Some of our karma is very messed up. And there's just always going to be stuff that's, I mean, presumably this group that he is referring to did not exist in the Buddhist time in, in India. Maybe, you know, some merchant or something came through but I mean there was no appreciable uh, influence but I mean there was always I mean there were like cannibals and, and like like robbers infesting the forests that would kill people or grab them and sell them into slavery or something and uh, kings I mean on the list of the bad things that, that you had to be careful of you know even above wild animals was kings which just meant uh, you know, you had just warring states in northern India in the Buddhist time. So you had, uh, it was it was an age of, like, expansion. There were, there were some old republics that still were in existence, but the kingdoms were expanding. It was like a time for, for autocratic kings to uh, start taking over. And eventually, the king of Magadha took over almost all of India in, in ancient times, not long after the time of the Buddha. So, I mean, there's, there's always been this kind of stuff. Like, uh, you know, in, in the West, um, there's, let's just take it random, pull out of a hat, you know, that you've got, you know, the Christians and the Jews in Western civilization since, since ancient times, since, since the advent of Christianity, but before that it was pagans and Jews. And, um, it wasn't just one side causing suffering to the other. There was just this chronic antagonism going on. They were, I mean, they were inflicting misery on each other. There were a lot of, you know, pogroms, you know, anything bad happens, the bubonic plague comes along and, you know, it's the Jews poisoning wells and then they get tortured. And then of course, under torture, they would admit to poisoning the wells. And, and there you go, you got your proof. Uh, it just, it just goes on. And in the West, it just seems like it's it's just become entrenched as a kind of symbiosis, and symbiosis isn't necessarily positive. You know, it's I mean, you can have negative symbiosis, like a dog with fleas. The, the fleas are symbionts; they're parasites, but still, it's symbionts. So I'm not saying that one side is is like entirely parasitic on the other, but. I mean, there's, there's just all this crap that's going on in this world. And the only way you can really cure yourself of being stuck in it is just to detach. And once you're detached, it doesn't matter what you do, really. I mean, it's, it's as I keep saying over and over again, it's like one of the predominant themes of these Q&As is that 
really an action is moral or immoral, not because of the, the outward physical action itself, but because of the mental states that are motivating that action. And so, I mean, you, you do what you need to do. I, um, some things are very difficult to do with wholesome mental states like lying or killing. So you got to be careful about that. But uh, yeah, I mean, everything that happens to us, every every sensation, every vedana that we experience, according to Orthodox Theravada, is the result of our karma. In a way, where we're creating our own world, and so you have just created a world with this uh, this group in it. And uh, yeah, I've thought about that. It's like um, I've got good enough karma, knock wood, that uh, I haven't. Uh, really been adversely affected by say terrorism the terrorist groups that have not blown up my house or tried to kill me or anyone close to me but i do have bad enough karma that at least i'm hearing about it i'm seeing about seeing it in the news and all that so i'm creating a world that i'm living in that that has badness in it even though it's at a distance and uh yeah i mean it's really it's just a matter of perception how you perceive things like uh one one saying of mine that i like is uh it doesn't matter what it is if you accept it it's not a problem and it doesn't matter what it is if you won't accept it it's a problem and that doesn't mean even if you accept it, it doesn't mean that you have you don't get to do anything to fix it like you get a flat tire you accept that you've got a flat tire. That doesn't mean you're just going to sit by the side of the road or just get out and leave your car behind, just abandon it because the, the tire is flat. You just accept the tire is flat. Now I accept that the thing to do is to fix the tire. And so you fix the tire with some modicum of equanimity going. So, I mean, that's, that's as far as I'm concerned, that's, that's really how we have to go about it. I mean, I can't really, like, you know, advocate for violent revolution or or some such so i guess i'm just going to have to uh stay with stay with that okay the next question from the Arya sawasti project is as follows i am reasonably fit and don't find it too difficult to sit in meditation posture and uh it has it spelled mediation, which is the most common typo when typing meditation because the spell check doesn't say anything. But uh, I digress. I'll just start over. I am reasonably fit and don't find it too difficult to sit in meditation posture, normally one half hour to an hour and a half, but sometimes I can get incredible pain in the mid portion of my back. I don't think it's entirely physical. Maybe working out psychological issues or something else. Your comments would be welcome on that. But my question, would it be counterproductive to take aspirin or some other pain reliever before meditation? I'm not trying to be a monk as of now, but I also try not to cheat my progress by involving something that might create a false sense or state of mind. Warm regards, much respect, sadhu. Well, this is just very common. The person experiences pain in meditation. Um, you know, usually it's like knee pain or ankle pain or hip pain. Um, if you're sitting cross-legged on the floor, for example, um, and, uh, yeah, I've, I've experienced a lot of back pain. I went to one meditation retreat, um, not really very long ago in, uh, in California where it was just pain. I mean, it was like the muscles in my back were just restructuring themselves because I hadn't been sitting like full time like that, just all day, essentially, just walking and sitting, walking and sitting all day. Um, I hadn't been doing that for a long time. And so my back muscles and tendons and so forth had to just take a crash course in, in doing that. And it, um, yeah, it was, it was very painful. And I wasn't, taking aspirin at the time. I mean, it was only like a, a two month retreat, but, um, and by the end of the two months, I was pretty much adjusted. But, um, there, there are really two schools of thought on this issue. One is like a Mahasi method, uh, the old school Mahasi method before the, uh, the, the wimpy Westerners really, uh, really got their, their hooks into it. 
but it was it used to be that um, Mahasi Seattle would teach that pain is the friend of the meditator. Pain is the key that unlocks the door to Nibbana. And it is really easy to be mindful of pain. I mean, your your mind doesn't wander away from it very much. Uh, so, I mean, there is that. And he was, I mean, Mahasi Seattle was endorsing heroic effort where even though the pain becomes so intense that you feel like you're going to die, you do not change position. You, you sit for the full hour or, you know, however long you, you're supposed to be sitting. And uh, there are some other teachers. I can't remember his name. He, uh, let's see, what was it called? There's this, there's this Burmese meditation method, uh, The Ingu, the The Ingu method, which is kind of a big deal in the northwest of Burma, where I lived for many years. And there's this one Seattle who, I mean, you, you sit in the full lotus for like, 24 hours straight it's just it's just insane and somehow just the the pain of it and just having to sit there for for so long it can like you know you just kind of phase out into a, a like an altered state of consciousness or something so i mean that's that's a pretty extreme version of it but um on the other hand i really don't see any problem with uh like taking aspirin like um, there have been times when, you know, you're just sitting so much and maybe wearing the same robe every day that you start getting like bed sores on your behind from sitting so much. And um, I mean, it just makes sense that you just, you know, get a rolled up towel or something and arrange it a little bit so it doesn't hurt so bad. Or I don't see anything necessarily wrong with taking aspirin or ibuprofen. I mean, you want to probably stay away from the the, the heavy painkillers, the narcotic stuff, but um, um, yeah, I, I really, it's it's just your own call, which, which causes you to make the most progress. I mean, if you're able to just watch the pain, then it may be to your advantage. You get a lot of practice at just watching pain. It may come really to your advantage someday when you've got pain, even when you're not sitting, that, you know, you're able to, to uh, bear it with equanimity. But on the other hand, if, if the pain is really distracting you and making your meditation worse, then, yeah, I mean, it probably makes sense to uh, take the aspirin or, or whatever, or, you know, whatever, whatever it takes. Um, I wouldn't totally wimp out and start sitting in a chair, but uh, that's just me. So let's see, I'll go back to here and hit the, hit the whole thing here. I'm reasonably fit, don't find it too difficult to sit in meditation, mediation posture. Normally one half hour to hour and a half. That's that's good. Like um, my legs were never very um, flexible. And so sitting in the full lotus for an hour and a half was, that was a challenge. I, I've done it, but it was, you know, it's usually hurting pretty bad by the time you get to get to an hour or so. But sometimes I can get incredible pain in the mid portion of my back. Incredible pain? I don't believe it. That was a joke. I don't think it's entirely physical. Yeah, well, it's, yeah, even a broken arm isn't entirely physical from the Buddhist point of view. Because it's the, it's the fruition of karma. At least in part. Maybe working out psychological issues, yeah. Your comments would be welcome on that, but my question would be counterproductive. Yeah, yeah. So we're getting back to should he take aspirin or not? And it really, it's, you know, you have to know from your own experience whether um, just sitting there in pain is actually being of benefit to you in your meditation practice, or if it's just derailing it, then, I mean, you're going to have to make adjustments. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Rob, alias Dhamma Farmer. So Rob says, as a trusted and authoritative figure on Theravada Buddhist texts, can you please point me in the right direction so I can find queer theory in the Pali texts? I've never heard of any queer theory in there, so I was intrigued. And I think he's referring to, there are these like radical lefty Western Buddhist academics. Um, apparently they're lesbians also. Um, and one of them who is, has written articles that have mentioned me in it and just mentioned, you know, right-wing extremist Buddhism, um, 
they uh they have like a degree in buddhist studies and specialize in uh queer theory in relation to buddhism which of course is indicative of their approach to buddhism um yeah queer theory in the pali texts uh you know there is some mention of homosexuality to some degree in the the books of monastic discipline especially with regard to um who can and cannot be ordained according to the rules and so uh it's mainly you have to be a man to be ordained as a monk and that means you've got to have a a, a set of cojones which means you know trans men you know it's not going to work with them they're not going to even if they go through the ceremony they're still not going to be monks because it's just they're automatically disqualified from the get-go um but there there are there's like the intermediate stage of not being fully male and not being fully female and that's the pandika and there's all these different kinds of pandikas usually it means like a, a eunuch you know it's in, that was fairly common in ancient times in, in certain cultures, not just in India, where, you know, boys would be castrated before puberty and they would become uh, like prostitutes or bathhouse attendants or just slaves attending the, the, the women, that kind of a thing. And um, there's, of course, in the polytext and the commentaries, they're very elaborate trying to you know systematize and explain everything and so they have lists of different kinds of pandikas and they've got like the part-time pandika which uh could be a bisexual could i mean um yeah so that's about as, as close to, to queer theory as you're going to get i mean there in ancient times there really wasn't much of a, a concept of homosexuality like in ancient Greece and Rome, there wasn't much of a concept of homosexuality. It was mainly just, you know, if you're on top, you're still the, you're still playing the part of the man. So you can have sex with eunuchs or, or, or women or, or, you know, youths or whatever. And uh, you're still, I mean, as long as you're on top, essentially, then you're still masculine. And uh, it may be that ancient India was similar. There were... Um, there was a certain unsavory reputation of, you know, like barbers and uh, bathhouse attendants and so forth. Um, but I mean, it's it's never really addressed as a as a burning issue like it is all of a sudden in the West, because I mean, it was never really a burning issue unless it was, you know, queers being burned at the stake by Christians, you know, like in the Middle Ages or something or not even necessarily Christians, I mean, Muslim, I mean, no religion really uh, has, uh, really endorses homosexuality or, or queerness, maybe Hinduism a little bit, you know, you've got the gopis, you know, the men that are cross-dressers at least um, in their in their religious practice. But um, yeah, this is kind of a joke question. I think maybe I'm taking it a little too seriously. So I'm just going to move on to Rob alias Dhamma Farmer's next question. Your story about the Burmese villager hating you got me thinking, and that the story was uh, uh, a few weeks ago in, uh, in on my blog. I just told this story that I'd never told before of this this villager who started hating me just because his dog bit me, and so it really wasn't my fault. I mean, I was walking for alms, and I had stopped in front of his house, and his daughter or daughter-in-law um, would offer me food every morning. That I, every morning that I stopped there. Um, and offered relatively good food too. But uh, one day the dog just came out and bit me and, and then because of that, his family got kind of a bad reputation. You know, people were asking me way over the other side of the village, you know, if I was going for alms on the other side of the village, did so-and-so's dog really bite you? That kind of a thing. And also I never saw the dog again. So maybe it was because of the dog biting me that he had to get rid of it or maybe he even killed it. So, Anyway, he just started hating me, even though I really hadn't done anything. I mean, even after the dog bit me, I was just saying, you know, don't worry about it. It's okay. You know, no problem. So let's see. I've completely digressed from the question here, though. Your story about the Burmese villager hating you got me thinking. I've also met people in the past who instinctively hate me without ever saying anything to them 
or wronging them? Could this be the result of past life karma rather than just an inability to click? Yeah, sure. I mean, as I as I've already said, like at least twice, anything that happens to you that you experience, you know, any any kind of sensation that arises, according to Orthodox Theravada, is the fruition of karma. And uh, I'm inclined to go along with that, maybe even to a, a more radical degree than Orthodox Theravada, because I really do not believe in the ultimately real existence of physical matter. So to some degree, we're just in a simulation, we're in the matrix, we're, we're dreaming, whatever, whatever you, however you want to interpret it. So, yeah, I mean, there could be a certain amount of just randomness, the sort of neutral randomness, if, if it's not really you know, getting, um, you know, really intense on you or something, you know, somebody just, just instinctively dislikes you. Like, um, there was one, I've been told that there was one person, I won't, I don't want to give too many details because he might watch this, but, uh, I was told that at first he didn't like me just because I was like tall or something. And, um, but then you know everything's fine now. I mean, I I he didn't hear anything about it until we we're we we're already good friends. So, so yeah, something like that. I mean, who knows? But yeah, if, if someone is like antagonizing you, yeah, that would be the fruition of karma, at least in part. Um, I don't know enough about Rob, uh, alias Dama Farmer here, to know. I mean, maybe he just has the kind of looks. I mean, some people. I mean, it's it's like. You know, some people just don't like blonde guys, for example. Not that I'm insinuating that Rob here is one of those, but um, still, it's, sometimes, I mean, it's just whatever. It, you, maybe just you, you walk funny or uh, you're just wearing kind of glasses that maybe they, their teacher in sixth grade who hated them wore or something. You know, it can be all kinds of weird things. But if it's happening to you, then karma has something to do with it. So I'll just move on to the next question. And this is from Mary J. Mary spelled M-E-R-R-Y and J spelled J. What is the penance when you break rules as a monk? What is that you actually have to do? Well, that's that's a good question. And with regard to most rules, there's there's at, I think it's seven. You see, the, the highest you know, the most serious rules that you can break are the parajika. And if you break those, you don't have to do anything other than just get the hell out because you're not a monk anymore. You're just instantaneously excommunicated as soon as you perpetrate the act. So below that is Sangadi Sesa. And I'll get back to that one. That one you have to you have to do penance for six days and six nights plus an additional day and night for every day that you didn't confess, that you concealed your offense. And then below that, you've got Tulachaya. Then you've got Pachidia, two different kinds of Pachidia. You've got Nisigiya Pachidia and just ordinary Pachidia. Then below that is Patidesaniya. Then you've got Dukkada offense and you've got Dubasita offense. And there's only one Dubasita offense, which is making a joke at somebody else's expense. So let's see, Tulachaya all the way down to Dubasita. All you do is you make confession. It's just a you know, two monks, you got to uncover your shoulder, you squat down, like, you know, you make Anjali like this. Uh, the se the junior monk bows to the senior monk. And then there's just this formula, Hamban de Saba Apatio Obikaromi. And then the other monk says, Sadhu, Abuso, Sadhu, Sadhu. And then the first monk says, Hamban de Sambahula Nanawutaka. And then he'll say what kind of offenses he committed. Or Burmese monks just say all offenses. You know, they don't really, they don't really admit to anything other than that they did something. And it just goes back and forth. It's just this stereotype formula. And then at the end, it's sadhu, also sadhu, sadhu. And then they, you know, that's it. And all of your offenses just miraculously poof out of existence. And that's the way a lot of monks see it. You break a rule, you just, you just squat down with another monk and do the necessary blah, blah, blah. And it just makes the, makes the rules disappear or makes the offense disappear. And you're, you're in good standing again, which is very corrupt, I think. Um, as, a, as a monk, at least I would try to specify what category of rule I had broken. And uh, I, I, I skipped over the, there's one obscure group of rules called Pati Desanaya rules. There's four of them. And I mean, they're just very rarely broken. 
And um, there's a, a different kind of confession you have to make for those. You just say, I, I committed this potty dacy offense, and you know, I, I, I can, you know, that's it. I confess it. So, um, with regard to everything below Sangadi Sesa, all you have to do is just make confession. With regard to Nisigi Apachidya rules, like um, the, the most common one is handling money, you have to get rid of whatever it is that you're not supposed to have, like, like the money, and then you make the confession. So, um, you got monks making confession and for, for handling money is, is you know, there's, it doesn't erase it because you still got the money after the confession, so you're still breaking the rule. But with regard to Sangadi Sesa, and there are 13 of them, and some of them are easily broken, and other ones just nobody, I mean, it's just not an issue anymore. It's like uh, an aspect of ancient Indian Buddhism that just doesn't arise anymore. Um, but um, like touching a woman deliberately because you like touching the woman, it, that's one. Or um, deliberately having an orgasm is, a, is another one that can happen fairly easily, especially for young monks that are uh, still full of male vitality, so to speak. And uh, with regard to those, there's something like 90 or 100 penances that have to be done for the six days and six nights. And I don't remember all of them. Some of them are fairly obscure, but some of the main ones are you're not allowed to sleep with the other monks. You have to live in an outbuilding on the outskirts of the monastery. You have to go in back of the line. You have to sit in back. Um, you have to bow to every other monk. It's like you are the junior monk so long as you're taking this penance. You're not allowed anybody to bow down to you. Uh, you're not allowed to, uh, let's see. Uh, you're not supposed to be teaching Dhamma when you're, when you're doing this penance. Um, Let's see, what else? You have to stand up whenever another monk approaches you, that kind of a thing. You know, it's essentially, you're just becoming the lowliest, most junior monk at the monastery uh, while you're doing this penance. That's essentially what it amounts to. And then uh, you get reinstated by this ceremony of, oh, also, uh, the most difficult penance you have to do is you have to make confession to every single monk that you come across. Every monk that you see, even if you're out in the village going for alms, you see a monk there, you got to go and make confession to him. So that is, that's the most difficult part because if you're at a busy monastery with monks coming and going, you know, you're going to, you go to make confession to so-and-so and, and, you know, he, he took off that morning and didn't tell you. So that day doesn't count. So, yeah, I mean, that's, that's essentially what you have to do. And then you go through the ceremony with 20 monks in good standing, have to all participate and that involves you to be like squatting on your, squatting on your, like just in a squatting position for a very long time. And it, it can get very painful. I have read that uh, the Jain ascetics who would literally torture themselves, one of the, their most favorite tortures, self tortures, was just to remain in a squatting position. And if you don't, if you don't think it hurts, just stay in a squatting position. Just watch, you know, like a 45 minute video or something while just squatting there in front of the TV or the computer and your your feet are going to be burning and you're going to be in pain before half an hour is up. So that, that could be one of the most difficult parts of the whole penance is just squatting through the long ceremony at the end. But um, as I say, most most rules, if you break them, all you have to do is just confess. And, um, you know, there, you have, you're supposed to confess to a monk that hasn't broken the same rule, um, that doesn't have the same unconfessed offense, and so forth. But it's, it's just very corrupt. It's, it's really, in, in Thailand even, where Vinaya or monastic discipline is still practiced relatively strictly, it's still, it's still corrupt. Like the confession, they don't actually say what rules they broke. And uh, even if they didn't break the rules, they still confess just just in case but that's against the rules also and uh in in burma they make confession twice because the first the second time you're can you're making confession for breaking the new rule of making confession to a monk who's broken the same rule without not confessing it it's, it's all very complicated and also the the whole six days and six nights of penance um in burma especially um i can really can't say what it's like in other countries it's, it's gotten so corrupt that they just do it at night. You know, so long as you've got a, at least a minute of daylight, 
then uh, that's that's good enough. They just you know take the take the duties and when everyone's asleep, and you know they can't they don't have to like humiliate themselves like like a senior monk like the abbot of a monastery, you know some of them I mean they're they're so established as the king of their own monastery that they're not going to go in the back of line. They're not going to get down on their knees and bow to the junior monks there. You know, that's just it's just unthinkable. It's just a non-starter. So yeah, there's all this complications and corruptions and subtleties and so forth and so um the short answer what penance when you break rules as a monk yeah you just if it's a sangha de Cesar rule that you broke you take the penance for six days and six nights and you're essentially the lowest the lowliest monk the most junior monk at the monastery and you have to confess what you did every day to every monk there and then anything else you just do the the, the ritual blah 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 which uh, makes it proof out of existence so just moving on here next question is from iz and iz says hi david what about pee pee poo poo gay butt sex games is there much of it going on among the monks in asia is there much of it going on among the monks in the west what about the ladies well i'm not sure what ladies here is referring to is it nuns or is it like female supporters of the monks i'm not sure but um yeah there there are a lot of gay monks in asia i'm not sure about western monk probably a lower percentage of western gay monks but like in in burma becoming a monk is just a socially acceptable way of not getting married and so they're like latent homosexuals and um my experience in Burma was that just about every meditation center in the Mahasi tradition especially will have sort of a an assistant abbot who is gay or acts very gay and they they like the the comfortable places in town like the relatively well supported rich comfortable monasteries you know got rich donors they, they tend to accumulate there and they don't like just the rough forest asceticism stuff very much but so with regard to actually practicing homosexuality, I've heard very little of it. I've, I've heard more about it in Thailand than I did in Burma, even though I lived in Burma for more than 20 years and lived in Thailand for a total of maybe three weeks. But I still, I've, I heard more about the sort of you know, buggery, um, which of course causes the monk not to be a real monk anymore. He's just immediately excommunicated, just spontaneously as soon as he starts the act as soon as uh, there's the penetration of the width of a of a sesame seed so long as the penetration is you know like one millimeter or two millimeters or something that's it he's not a monk anymore even if you know nobody nobody else at the monastery hears about it you know even though he's still dressed in robes and everything he's really not a monk anymore so yeah, it does happen. I'm happy to say that it's not really this scandalous thing that is running rampant in Theravada Buddhism. There are a few gay Western monks, and uh, I heard this one scandal of a relatively famous Western monk who was uh, deported from Singapore, I think it was, because he was messing around with uh, some uh, laymen there. But still, it's relatively rare. And even the monks that are you know, attracted to other males or, you know, they're just born that way or, or whatever it is, they're, they tend to be latent. You know, the overwhelming majority are just, you know, sort of effeminate monks that like comfy, cushy monasteries. And, uh, you know, they, they can still be good monks. You know, they're, it's like one of my first spiritual teachers uh, through books was Ram Das, and he was a switch hitter. He was, he was bisexual. So they can, you know, be spiritually advanced as, as well as, you know, heterosexuals, I assume. Um, with regard to the ladies, with regard to nuns, I have no idea. I mean, I really have had very few interactions with, with nuns, either in Burma or in the West. You know, a little bit, you know, you, you meet them, you see them on the bus or whatever. Um, but I really can't say what the deal is with them. Uh, with regard to like female supporters of monks, then you know lay women. 
Yeah, that happens. I've heard stories about monks who were just like serial seducers of female lay supporters and that kind of a thing. And so they're they're not they're, one or two of them was uh, relatively high level. I mean, I've had a reputation for acting inappropriately in that regard for a, a while, but uh, I never excommunicated myself. I never actually went to the extent of uh, actually seducing, um, you know, t do doing the full course of seduction, so, so to speak. Um, so yeah, I'd say that it does exist, but it is rare. I'm not sure about Thailand. And there were times in Sri Lanka, like in medieval times, when the monks were so lax and, and just not following the rules, so unconscientious that uh, they had to restart the Sangha by bringing in foreign monks to start doing ordinations to get real monks again, because um, it was just the standard practice um, a few times in the history of Sri Lanka, or so I have read, that monks would just be getting married and having kids and so forth. And, um, but that is, nowadays, that is rare. Even in Sri Lanka, there have been, um, there are some reform movements that are relatively very strict. So it's not like you hear about in uh, like Roman Catholicism where, you know, there's just hundreds of priests that are seducing young boys. I heard one rumor in Burma of, uh, a monk that had messed around with um, an, an, el, uh, an older novice who was of, you know, 18, 19, 20 years old. But uh, it was just a rumor, and uh, I have no idea if it's true or not. And that's the only, the only rumor of that sort of thing that I ever heard the whole time I was living in Burma. So the Burmese are fairly conservative in certain ways. So I think I'll just move on to the next question, which is from Mirror of Emptiness. And Mirror of Emptiness says, Are you familiar with the writings and ideas of the controversial monk Bhikkhu K. Nyanananda? If so, what was it that was so controversial to many Orthodox Theravada monks, and what do you think of his views? Well, I think I mentioned Nyanananda uh, just uh, a few shows ago, and I have to admit, this is sort of like uh, the question about... Um, uh, what's his name? Anagaraka uh, Dhammapala. It's somebody that I have a very superficial knowledge of. And uh, the only thing I've ever read by Nyanananda is this book, which is one of the most important books on Theravada that you could read, Concept and Reality, in Early Buddhist Thought by Bhikkhu Nyanananda. And uh, he, he was like a, a teacher at the... Uh, he, he taught Pali studies at the University of Sri Lanka before he was a monk, I think. So he was an intellectual, a scholar, and had some Western ideas. And this book really was a groundbreaking Buddhist scholarship. It's an important book. Anyone who's serious about Buddhist philosophy and knows you know, the text, if, if you don't know the difference between the Anguttara Nikaya and the Samyutta Nikaya, then it might not be for you. But um, you know, if you know the difference between the Anguttara and the Samyutta, for example, you know, it, you, you'd know enough about uh, polytexts and so forth that you could uh, you could gain some benefit from this. And he was simply pointing out that the the commentarial tradition had misunderstood the word papancha for well over a thousand years, you know, fifteen hundred years or so. And he was pointing out very systematically, according to the texts, that papancha doesn't mean what the the commentary says it means. So um, that could be controversial. I'm sure there would be a lot of traditionalist, you know, reactionary monks who just say that the commentaries are right. Like a lot of Burmese monks, I remember once um, I was really not exactly a senior monk. I'd been a monk maybe seven or eight years. And this school monk came to, to live out in the forest for a while, the same monastery as me. And I remember he had really rotten teeth. I don't know why I remember that. But he just came and informed me that he wanted to teach me about, you know, the rules of monastic discipline and so forth. And it's possible I might have known more about them than he did, but uh, a lot of Burmese monks just assume that foreigners don't know anything. 
And so I was just going to give him some fair warning, you know, a little shot over the bow. I'm just saying, well, you know, I don't think the commentaries are always right. And he got this grin on his face and I just, and he just says, that's not possible. So a lot of Burmese monks, they just think that the commentaries are more important than the Pali texts themselves to some degree, because if, if, if the text says, you know, the Buddha says blue, but the commentary says when the Buddha said blue, what he really meant was red. Then if you don't read the commentary, you don't, you don't know that that's what the Buddha said. And so the commentaries do work that way to some degree. And uh, this Bhikkhu Nyanananda just kind of cut through that. You know, he's, he was traditionalist enough that he was taking the, the Pali text very seriously, but he was, um, in a sense, defying the commentarial tradition, you know, led by Venerable Buddha Gosa. And, you know, that's something that Westerners, Western monks, you know, probably most Western monks, really don't have much use for Buddha Gosism, Buddha Gosism, you know, which is just the commentarial interpretation, which is orthodox. I mean, technically, that is the orthodox approach to Theravana, but um, um, some of us who have the capacity for critical thought and individual, you know, we, we want to just make up our own mind about things. We don't just follow along sheep-like. Then, uh, yeah, we can we can acknowledge that sometimes the commentaries are really wrong. They're a lot. Sometimes they're just making wild stabs in the dark. They're just guessing at what they don't fully understand. Um, like like with regard to like the flora and fauna and some of the cultural aspects of North India, because the commentaries are written in South India and Sri Lanka about a, a thousand years. A lot of it came about a thousand years after the time of the Buddha. And so they didn't really know what, you know, this plant was or, or what that meant because it's just alien to their culture. They couldn't really, I mean, uh, in some respects, a modern Westerner can make a more accurate or plausible guess at what words mean than, than these commentators did. But with regard to anything else that Nyanananda wrote, I, he's, he wrote a few other things, but I think his main reputation just comes from from this book and it's the only it's the only book of his that I've read It's probably um, the only book of his that most people that have read him have read um, that was the one that really made the waves so I assume that's why he is controversial although he may have written other things that were even more controversial like maybe in private letters that got published or something so as I say I really don't know much about him other than you know, he was an academic before he was a monk, and uh, he wrote the book that I read a long time ago, and it's really not even fresh in my mind right now. So I'll just move on to the next question from Rafi46. And Rafi46 says, Do Jains believe there is a self? And the answer to that is yes, they do. That's a fairly simple one. Um, Jainism and Buddhism are very similar in certain respects, and they do have roots going back into the same probably the same Indus Valley civilization that had certain aspects of like pessimism. You know, the world is a bad place of suffering. You should try to escape from it. Um, like atheism, you know, there is no supreme God in Jainism or in Buddhism or in Sankhya, which also has its roots back, um, at least some roots going all the way back into the prehistoric Indus Valley civilization. Um, you know, they believe in karma. You're supposed to purify your karma in order to escape from this world of suffering and so forth. It's a common theme uh, with different takes on it. You know, there's different approaches to that in Buddhism and Jainism and, and you know, yoga, Sankhya. Um, so what the Jains believe is that everyone has a kind of immortal soul called a jiva or the, it's like life. Jiva literally means life. It's like the life force. It's, it's what they consider to be the soul. And karma is like a sticky, almost, it's like a physical substance that sticks to your jiva and weighs it down. So what the Jains were trying to do is to get rid of all of their karma, even the good karma, so that their, their soul would, would waft up into heaven. That's the, that's the short version. That's the Reader's Digest version of uh, Jain philosophy. And, uh, yeah, some of them would just literally torture themselves by squatting, for example, squatting for prolonged periods of time, um, you know, eating maybe once a week, not probably not as a continued practice, but.
maybe for a while. Um, some of them would go naked. Some of them still go naked. And uh, I wondered, I mean, in northern India, especially in the Buddhist time, it got down to about freezing in the coldest time of year. And it turns out they smear themselves with mud to survive um, survive the winter because uh, really they own nothing. They don't own a begging bowl or, or clothes or anything. They just own zero property other than just their own smelly carcass. But yeah, Ravi 46, the, the Jains do believe there is a self. It's called the Jiva. So I'll just move on to the next question. This is from Loki. And Loki says, what would be the best introductory what would be the best introductory book or books on primordial Buddhism? Ideally, those which entail practical exercises as well as cosmological components. Well, that's a good question. What is the introductory book on just primitive, archaic, pre-Theravadan Buddhism? Personally, I would have to say the Sutta Nipata, which is canonical. So, um, yeah, especially the Atika Waga. Read the Antika Vaga of the Sutta Nipata, and that is, I consider that to be the most important Buddhist document in existence, at least that we know of. Maybe there's something buried under the ground somewhere that uh, is more important, at least potentially. But uh, it's the largest chunk of really primitive, pre Theravadan Buddhism still in existence. So your best introduction to primordial Buddhism would be the, the Atika Waga, in my opinion, without question. Because anything besides that, uh, it's going to be academic stuff written by scholars who, in all probability, aren't Buddhists and haven't lived the life. And they have some really interesting, really brilliant ideas sometimes. But a lot of the time, you know, they just have this mind that, um, you know, a lot of intellectuals are this way. They've got a mind like a scalpel and it causes a kind of tum tunnel vision. You know, they, they see what they're looking at really precisely, but they, they don't see the big picture. So, yeah, I, the best introductory book on primordial Buddhism is the Atika Waga, and it's a mind blower. It's well worth reading. Anybody should study it if they want to understand what the Buddha really taught. So I'll just move on to the last question. And the last question is from Deed. And Deed asks, what do I want for my birthday? Because my birthday is coming up. Well, I already know a couple things that I'm getting. I'm going to get a, a holster for a Glock. That's nice. Um, with regard to stuff that I don't know that I'm already getting, I would like to get a harmonica. I, would, I wouldn't mind getting a harmonica, you know, a nice one in a versatile key, perhaps. And aside from that, I'll probably work that day. So get a good cake. It was, my, it was the tradition in my family when I was a kid. I always got rhubarb upside down cake for, for my birthday. But uh, that is so esoteric that um, it might not really be plausible. So... Um, so with no rhubarb upside down cake, we'll just go for some kind of chocolate, something relatively decadent. And uh, just a nice dinner at home, you know, hang out with my sweetheart. That would be a good birthday for me. I'm really not much into holidays. I'm having to get back into that mode um, after, now that I'm not only not a monk anymore, but I'm engaging in society and also have uh, a sweetheart. So, yeah, I mean, you definitely don't want to forget her birthday. But um, there were times as a monk, you know, I'd just be standing there scratching my head, looking at the calendar, trying to figure out what day it was. And then I'd realize, oh, wait a minute, yesterday was my birthday or yesterday was Christmas. And, you know, it's just all days are all days are Buddha day. So, but, you know, I it's it's not that bad of a of a tradition, have birthdays and send people cards and that kind of a thing. So. Yeah, anyone who uh, just wants to give me a birthday present. I wouldn't mind getting a, it's like, I can't slide lock for a Glock 19. It, it's it's an extended one, an extended slide lock. I think that's what they're called. Either that or just money, you know, whatever. But that uh, that's essentially what I want for my birthday. I mean, really, I'm, I'm not, although I'm easy to get stuff for because up until recently I owned almost nothing. Um, I've already got enough socks and underwear. And uh, 
I'm still more or less of an aesthetic, even though I might live a somewhat luxurious life when I'm not at work in a non air conditioned metal shop in South Carolina, which is, yeah, that's, that's an aesthetic practice right there. But, um, some, some of my life is relatively luxurious, although, uh, um, I don't really, you know, I, I, my sweetheart's a really good cook, but, uh, you know, I could eat peanut butter sandwiches with equanimity too. Not that I'm complaining. I don't want to sound like I'm complaining. Not like I want to eat peanut butter sandwiches, especially not for my birthday. But I guess that's it. That's the last question. And so uh, if you have any questions, I'm very happy to answer them to the best of my ability. I can't promise that I'll be able to give uh, an intellectual or learned answer, especially about some topic or some person that I know very little about. But uh, if you have any questions about uh, Buddhism, especially Theravada Buddhism, uh, Burmese Buddhism, uh, just my life living in caves and so forth, um, yeah, just put them in the comments below. I always uh, glean questions from the comment sections as well as in other places. If you're on the Discord server, you can leave your questions there. If you're subscribed to me on Subscribestar, you can leave your questions there. Or otherwise, just uh, in the comments below this video, either on uh, BitChute or uh, YouTube. And uh, all of my URL links are, are below, including those from my books for sale on Amazon. And be happy.